Simbrance. I put together some educational programs, put together the Summer 69 exhibit, which was a lot of fun. On that note, two weeks from tonight, we will have a concluding lecture on the Summer of 69 program. And it's really a fascinating topic. Um, Al Hollandquist, who's an uh, aerospace historian, will be here. And he's going to talk about the Mercury 13 women. And it's a fascinating program where when they had the Mercury program, NASA recruited 13 women to be astronauts. And then shamanism kicked in along with budget constraints. And basically, they got thrown out of the program and never had their chance to fly. So it's going to be a fascinating program. That will be two weeks from tonight right here in the theater. Now, have you ever come to a sudden realization about something and had kind of an aha moment when those things go, wow, I never realized that. December 17, 1903, Orville Wright flew 120 feet in 12 seconds, 20 feet off the ground. And we consider that the first manned flight in this country. They flew four times that day. The fourth time was the best. 59 seconds and 852 feet. They kept the plane in the air almost a minute. Now, every landing was a controlled crash. They had to fix the plane after every landing because it collapsed. Um, after the fourth flight, they couldn't do it anymore because a gust of wind blew the plane over and the plane never flew again. It was destroyed. 63 years later, we went from that right flyer, sticks, wire, fabric on the wings, and we journeyed 70, in 76 hours, 240,000 miles in the lunar orbit. 63 years after having a plane made out of sticks and wire, we circled the moon, and not only that, we safely <coughs> landed on the moon. The lunar lander didn't blow over. They didn't have to fix it before they took back off again. And our guest tonight, that's kind of my wow moment, 63 years ago from sticks and, wing, sticks and wire to landing on the moon. Our guest tonight is a man who helped make that possible. I'm not going to give you his back end credentials. I'll let him do it himself. But I'd like to introduce Pete Mush. I uh, graduated from Clarkson University, upstate New York, as a mechanical engineer. We needed all phases of the sciences and engineering to do this job. You didn't have to be a, an aeronautical or astrophysical uh, member. Um, I worked for Grumman Aerospace for about a year, and then they put me on the lunar module project. And I worked on the descent propulsion portion of the lunar module. So in 66, I transferred down to Cape Kennedy, or Kennedy Space Center. Did all the pre-flights, uh, the lunar landing with Neil Armstrong in January 20th of this year, uh, tw January 20th, 50 years ago. We had a big celebration uh, January 20th of this year. Um, and. Uh, the Apollo 13 rescue was another important part of the uh, lunar module project where the lunar module actually was used as a lifeboat that saved their lives. So I put together a program. Some of it is a little basic and elementary because I do show it at the schools. So let's get started. I'm going to turn this mic around a bit here. Just a couple of things about the uh, Earth dynamics. The Earth is our launch platform for everything going up into space. It's 8,000 miles in diameter. Circumference at the equator is right at 25,000 miles. So one day rotation is 24 hours, as we well know. And the rotation of the Earth is to the east. A man standing at the equator is actually traveling about a thousand miles an hour to the east relative to the space above him, but he has no concept of this. Take 25,000 miles, divide it by 24 hours, and that's how you come up with a thousand miles an hour. 
He has no sensation because he is pinned to the earth by the gravitational force of the earth and the atmosphere rotates with him. The sun isn't moving during a sunrise or a sunset. The earth is actually revolving. So when your wife says to you or your husband says to you, did you see that beautiful sunset tonight? You're supposed to say, no, did you see that beautiful earth rotation tonight? Because <laughs> that's what's happening. Same applies to the moon. A man standing at the North Pole would actually turn one revolution at his feet is he, he's standing at the top of the axis of the rotation of the earth so he turned one, he would turn one revolution in 24 hours probably freezing to death at the same time <laughs> now at smaller latitude rings if you come up to the Kennedy Space Center area or even the Stewart area at a smaller latitude ring the man standing there is traveling about 850 miles an hour to the east and that's what we're doing right now relative to the space above us. We don't feel it, but we're doing it. <clears throat> this also includes the launch platforms at Kennedy Space Center. And why I'm elaborating on this is why it's important. All payloads and satellites need to reach a speed of 17,500 miles an hour to obtain a circular orbit around the Earth at 100 to 200 miles. That's called a low Earth orbit. And this is a function strictly of the Earth's gravitational field. <clears throat> if you go to the Moon, the Moon has one sixth gravity. We'll go into that later. It's a lot slower. When Cassini orbited Saturn, Saturn has a much stronger gravity than Earth. Cassini orbited Saturn at 76,000 miles an hour. So it's all a function of the uh, planet you're trying to orbit or the moon you're trying to orbit. Now since the launch platforms at the Kennedy Space Center are traveling about 850 miles an hour to the east due to the rotation of the Earth, this is a benefit while trying to get to 17,500 miles an hour, you're already moving at 850 miles an hour, that's a bonus. So now, to build a booster, you only have to get to 16,625 miles an hour to obtain an orbit. Now, just one comment here, it's a good reason we didn't build the facility in Tampa and launch west over the Gulf. <laughs> Because well, you could have, but if you did, you'd have to go 17,500 miles an hour plus 850 to get into orbit. So you need to build a booster that's 15 or 20 percent bigger. Now what happens if you go slower than 17,500? You'll re-enter the atmosphere. Let's say you're traveling at 16,000 miles an hour. It's very fast and you'll burn up unless you have an ablative shield on your re-entry vehicle. The space capsules did and the shuttle did on the bottom of the space uh, of the shuttle. If you go faster than 17,500, you're going to go into an elliptical orbit with an apogee, the highest point, and a perigee, the lowest point. And you'll stay in that elliptical orbit until you change something. If you go faster than 25,000 miles an hour, you will escape Earth's gravitational field and go into a solar orbit around the sun. The reason I bring this up in going to the moon, we had to get up to a speed of 25,000 miles an hour to escape the Earth's gravity to get to the moon. <clears throat> a little bit about communication satellites and TV satellites. I don't know if you realize, but they all orbit at an altitude of about 22,000 miles. And why is this important? Well, here the Earth's gravity, it diminishes as you move away, the strength of the field diminishes as you move away from the Earth. And at 22,000 miles, it is about one third of the strength of the gravitational field at sea level. 
therefore the orbital speed required to maintain a circular orbit doesn't have to be 17,500, it drops to 6,800 miles an hour. Now, at this, speed, at this uh, altitude of 22,000 miles and at 6,800 miles an hour, if you draw the circle and do the math, take the circle and multiply it times pi, it'll take 24 hours for that satellite to go one revolution. So the Earth is also rotating one revolution of 24 hours. So it gives you the appearance that the satellite is hanging over your head. These communication satellites are up there right now. They look like they're hanging there, but they're moving at 6,800 miles an hour to the east. We're moving at 850 to the east. So we're in sync with them. They can take a satellite and hang it there and they can broadcast from Asia up to the satellite down to Europe. Once in orbit, satellites don't really care if the Earth is revolving or not. The fact that the Earth does revolve is why communication and TV satellites work so well. The Moon has a diameter of just over 2,000 miles, and its gravity is about one-sixth of that of Earth. The orbital speed at 60 miles, this is where the uh, command service module and lunar module orbited before descent, is about 3,600 miles an hour. <clears throat> then came the initial challenge from uh, President Kennedy. Uh, January 61, I think he made this statement at Rice University, uh, and he we were behind the Soviets. Uh, one of my fellow Grumanites, who is a vice president of research, informed me recently that the reason we were behind the Soviets is because of Eisenhower. And I said, what did he have to do with it? And he said, well, Eisenhower had retired as the famous general in World War II in the military. And Eisenhower refused to let NASA use any of the military uh, rocketry that was developed at that time. And when Kennedy came along, he kind of overrode that. And he made this statement, this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. <clears throat> the Russians had launched the first satellite Sputnik in 1957 and had made some successful manned orbital flights. The U.S. was far behind the Russians in the space race and would utilize three programs to accomplish a lunar landing. This was the Mercury, the Gemini, and the Apollo program. I remember well when I was in high school, our first attempt of launching a satellite was on the Vanguard. This was about 58 or 59, and the Vanguard went up about six or eight feet and then cr crumbled back to earth in a big explosion. And I thought, come on US, you can do better than that. And, and as luck would have it, and it was just, I was in the right place at the right time, I would be working on the program, so. The Mercury program consisted of a space capsule with one astronaut, and the goals were to orbit a manned spacecraft around the earth, to investigate his ability to function in space and to recover both a man and spacecraft safely. The program consisted of six launches uh, between May of 61 and May of 63. The first two were on a Mercury Redstone rocket, which was not capable, it didn't have the, the uh, enough power to get into a, an orbit of 17,500 miles an hour, but it did get up into what's called outer space. Alan Shepard was the first American into space on May of 61. The Redstone payload could lift off 4,000 pounds. The next four Mercury 
uh, capsules were launched aboard an Atlas rocket. The Atlas payload was 3,000 pounds, but this rocket was capable of getting up to 17,500 miles an hour. And as many of you remember, John Glenn was the first to achieve Earth orbit on February 20th, 63. Next was a Gemini program that consisted of a two-man space capsule. The goals were to, rendez uh, to demonstrate rendezvous and docking in space. This was an important part of going to the moon, which we'll see later. Uh, the ability to do extracurricular activities. Item three was never done. It was a targeted reentry with an Earth landing. All landings that so far have been done in in the ocean. And to, to accomplish long duration flights, there were 10 manned flights between March of 65 and November of 66. The Titan II and III were used to launch the Gemini. Uh, the payload capacity of the Titan II was 8,000 pounds. The Titan II was the same missile that was used in many of the silos uh, that guard the perimeter of our USA territory. There were several spacewalks done during the Gemini project to prove that a man could operate outside the vehicle. And then came along the Apollo project. It consisted of a three-stage rocket to launch the lunar module and the command service module. The liftoff thrust of the Saturn V, it is still the biggest rocket developed by man so far to date, even by the Russians, was seven and a half million pounds of thrust. The total liftoff weight fully fueled was 6.5 million pounds. The total propellant in the first, second, and third stage and in the command service module was 5.6 million pounds. 86% of what you see on that pad was propellant. So this was just what I call a flying bomb. <laughs> the total payload weight that the Saturn V could lift was 240,000 pounds. Here's a picture of one of the five F1 engines that was on the first stage. That engine could produce one and a half million pounds. It was five of them to get to seven and a half million and it would burn almost 6,000 pounds of fuel or 671 gallons of fuel and oxidizer per second. By comparison, the state space shuttle, the peak liftoff was 6.7 million pounds. Each solid booster had 2.8 million pounds of thrust and there was three liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engines on the shuttle that had 375,000 pounds of thrust each. There were 135 missions flown. <clears throat> the maximum shuttle weight with cargo was 223,000 pounds. The payload it could carry was 65,000. The shuttle is what built the International Space Station. <clears throat> Once the boosters were jettisoned, the three shuttle engines propelled the craft from 3,000 to 17,500 miles an hour in six minutes. <clears throat> One of my big uh, disappointments in the U.S. government was in 2004, NASA had proposed a replacement for the shuttle program, and they put a, they put a deadline or a drop-dead date for the shuttle as 2011 and 2012. Well, in 2007, they scrapped the replacement design for the shuttle, and what we're doing today is paying the Russians $75 million per seat to fly our astronauts to the International Space Station. If two of our, two of our I guys go, $150 million. Well, it costs 
about 300 million to fly a shuttle. So I always thought that they should have kept the shuttle program going. We had 30, we had two shuttles with only 33 flights. They're good for 99. But uh, they decided to let it go and pay the Russians, which I didn't think was the right thing for USA to do and lose its prominence in space. <clears throat> now back to the Saturn V. It propelled the vehicle to 42 miles high, traveling just over 6,000 miles an hour, and the five F1 engines burned four million pounds of the six and a half million pounds of total weight in two and a half minutes to show you how much energy is required to get these things into orbit. <clears throat> the second stage had used five J2 engines. These were liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engines, and each engine could uh, produce 232,000 pounds of thrust. <clears throat> the second stage weighed a million pounds wet. 92% of the total weight was propellant. It was just a flying can with an engine on the back. <laughs> the third stage had one J2 liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engine, and the J2 engine could be shut down and restarted, which was necessary for translunar injection. And that's the third stage was used to insert the spacecraft into a translunar injection once it went into orbit. Here's a shot of the Apollo 11 payload. The command, sir, the command module is the conical piece on the very top. The service module is the straight cylinder below that, and in the uh, conical section is where the LEM lunar module was housed. The landing gear pads are folded and they're exposed out on the bottom. This was the actual rollout of Apollo 11 going to the pad from the Kennedy Space Center Vehicle Assembly Building on May 20th, 69. That, that missile was 363 feet tall. And you can see how tiny the cars are in the parking lot down there. And the control room for launch is right to the left of the missile in that uh, building with the windows facing the launch pad. With the launch, when it got down to, we controlled everything at Kennedy Space Center, 54321 liftoff, as soon as there was liftoff, all control of the mission switched to Houston. <clears throat> Here's the Saturn V crawler transporter. Uh, just in com by comparison, there's men standing around it. Each one of those pads, each pad on those tracks weighed one ton. I think it only traveled at like two to three miles an hour top speed. There were several swing arms that uh, went from the gantry over to, over to the Saturn V and this is the top one uh, called the white room where the astronauts would come across and get into the uh, command module. There were several Apollo prog uh, uh, programs run. Uh, Apollo 1, you might remember, was a, was a test on the pad where we had that terrible pad fire. And we lost three astronauts at, uh, during that time. Uh, there was kind of a moratorium to make sure we did everything correctly. I know one thing they changed on the command service module, which was not a Grumman product. Everything that Grumman built and flew on this mission was perfect. We had no issues at all. Uh, the command module was a North American uh, product. The hatch opened in, so when there was a fire and there was a pressure buildup in the capsule, the guys couldn't open the hatch. Well, they redesigned the hatch so it opened out. <clears throat> but Apollo 8 was the first significant flight to the moon. It was the Christmas flight. It was done so that it would orbit the moon Christmas Day, uh, December of 68. It did not land. Uh, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell were on that flight. Um, it orbited the Earth, uh, orbited the moon several times. This was one of the most famous photographs 
apparently published in the world of, a, of an earth rise. <clears throat> Apollo 9 was, was next. It, it was uh, a test of the command service module and lunar module in orbit. They, they were up there for quite a while. I, I think it was a 10 or 12 day mission. And they checked out the lunar module and everything checked out uh, perfectly. Uh, there might have been a few minor things, but they were, they were uh, approved to go on and fly to the moon. So they did that on Apollo 10. But they didn't quite land. They went to the moon. They uh, took the lunar module and flew down to within 10 miles of the lunar surface and then came back up and rendezvoused with the command service module just to prove that they could do that. And of course the next mission was Apollo 11 and that's when we actually landed. Um, eight and a half years after President Kennedy's challenge Man landed on the moon July 20th, 1969. We just had a fabulous 50-year celebration at the Cape. Uh, I was on, on the organizational committee to do that. Had 530 people at a big formal dinner underneath the booster in the Saturn V uh, Museum. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of the things to tell you on the on that first landing, the uh, lunar module computer had 48K of memory. <laughs> it was core memory. And when, it, when, it, when Armstrong brought it down, there was uh, a bunch of overload warnings on the computer. Couldn't handle all the data coming in. There was probably five or five people or so from different parts of the landing crew in Houston that were, uh, had the authority to abort. I think three or so of them were ready to abort. And one young lad who was in charge of the computer out there, one young engineer said, no, go. And he went and Armstrong landed. He had 16 seconds of fuel left when he landed. We had a little issue on Apollo 11 because they were four miles off their landing target. It was due to a problem of Doppler, and they resolved that on the next mission. The lunar excursion module was built by Grumman Aerospace in Bethpage, New York. This was uh, Plant 25, as shown in the background. That's where I worked for a while before I transferred to the Cape. Uh, Grumman also built the F-14 jet fighter for the Navy. We built, I think, 750 planes for the Navy. It was uh, one of the star fighters and has been replaced by a different equipment now. The next three years there was five additional landings and they were from, uh, last one was December 7, 72, LEM-12 on Apollo 17. <clears throat> Grumman built 15 lunar modules. Um, some of them were used for uh, ground testing. The LEM-2 is at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. If you haven't been there, you need to go see that. They now have two air and space museums. One is at downtown in Washington, D.C. The other one is out at the airport. And I, I think they're both free. You can get in there free, no admission. Uh, LEM-3 was on Apollo 9 did the Earth orbital checkouts. LEM-4 was on Apollo 10. Each one had a name. LEM-4 was Snoopy. The, uh, the astronauts uh, had the privilege of naming their lunar module. That one went within 10 miles of the moon and came back up and rendezvoused with the command service module. And then LEM-5 was Apollo 11. And you remember the famous quote by Armstrong, tranquility base here the eagle has landed. Uh, then a LEM-6 was interesting because that was uh, on Apollo 12 and the goal was to land near the Surveyor spacecraft which had, uh, was an unmanned spacecraft that had landed about three years earlier and they went out and they cut some pieces off the uh, 
the surveyor to bring back for analysis. LEM-7 was on Apollo 13, which was the disaster. I'll touch base on that in a minute. Uh, 14 was done, and then uh, LEM-9 wasn't flown, but Apollo 15, 16, and the next page is 17. Those three missions had a, a, um, a little card on it. Um, it carried the uh, lunar rover. Now, there's 12 men on the six missions that walked on the moon. Eight have passed away already. Only four are alive. I've shown all the missions up there, and the four in red are still alive today. Buzz Aldrin was with Neil Armstrong when he landed. He was the second man on the moon. On Apollo 15, David Scott is still alive. Apollo 16, Charlie Duke, and then down at 17 is Harrison Schmidt. He was the PhD geologist that went to the moon, and uh, he found some very interesting things about the moon's geology. <clears throat> On Apollo 13, I put those in green. Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell are still alive. Fred Hayes became uh, a vice president of Grumman after he left the astronaut program. Uh, we are having we're gearing up to do another celebration next year, April 17th. That was the Apollo 13 splashdown. And that's where Grumman paid, played a key role in getting him back. A little trivial pursuit question for you is, who, who, was the on, who was the only astronaut to go to the moon twice and never land? It was Jim Lovell. He was on Apollo Eight that did the Christmas flight, and then he was supposed to land on 13, and we had the disaster, and he had to come back. <clears throat> now, shortly after orbit insertion at 17,500 miles an hour, the third stage was, was fired to reach a speed of 25,000 miles an hour to escape the Earth's gravity. <clears throat> on the way, the command service module had to undock, do a 180 degree turn, and then redock with a lunar module so the astronauts could go from the command module into the lunar module. <clears throat> the third stage, after releasing the LEM and the command service module, this is a picture shown of it, would have, had, had escaped the Earth's gravity and it would go into a solar orbit. So there's about seven of these third stages that are in solar orbit as we speak. <clears throat> now, the moon orbits the Earth at about 240,000 miles. So two days after translunar injection, at about 200,000 miles from the Earth, and 40,000 miles from the moon, the Earth, Earth's gravity has slowed the spacecraft down to 2,500 miles an hour. Here, the gravitational effects of the moon and the Earth are equal. And I'm going to walk you through my model up here. <clears throat> I'll be off the microphone for a minute. But on this, on, this, on this scale, I found the moon I found in the grandkids' toy box that we have at home. <laughs> and it has some lines on it, which when we inhabit the moon, we can say those will be the new roads. <laughs> but on this scale, that moon would be 30 feet from this Earth on this scale. But we don't have 30 feet here. But after, after we launch and go in, to an orbit, we do a couple of laps, about 17,500. Around here, we fire the third stage and boost up to 25,000 miles an hour and head to the moon. Now on the way, the Earth is pulling us back and pulling us back and slowing us down. We get to a point about 200,000 miles, which is about here, and the speed of the spacecraft has slowed down 90% from 25,000 to 2,500. 
at this point, the moon's gravity becomes more influential than the Earth's gravity. So you, now you pick up speed as you accelerate into the, into the Earth. Now once you get here, you're traveling about 5,300 miles an hour. You have to slow down. It's a very critical maneuver. You have to slow down to 3,600, which, which is the velocity you need at 60 miles altitude to orbit the moon. If you don't slow down, you'll arc around the moon and head into a solar orbit, and there will be no recovery. So you do a de-boost here. You're supposed to do this with the service module. 3,600 miles an hour, do your orbit, the lamb would disconnect and go down and do its mission on the moon. When you come back and rendezvous, you fire the service module up again, head back to Earth, and uh, three days later you arrive back at Earth. When you re-enter that atmosphere, you're again returning at about 25,000 miles an hour, so it's a very critical uh, position you have to put the spacecraft in to land. If you come in too steep, you'll burn up. If you come in too shallow, you'll skip off the atmosphere and go in a solar orbit. So you have to come in just at the right altitude, the right angle of attack. Here, here the, uh, this is just a, demo, uh, a sketch of, of the mission, and I, I have this in case I don't bring my Earth-Moon mod model into a, into a, a talk. So. It describes the same thing, going up, orbiting the moon, coming back. <clears throat> Translunar injection is 25,000 miles an hour. So I'll go ahead and advance it. Here's a shot of the lunar module just prior to its first descent to the moon. The descent engine was, was an interesting engine because it could be throttled. Many rocket engines in the past, you light them up and go and burn them out and you're done. But here you had to have it throttleable so you could land and hover. So the, the descent engine could be throttled at 10% increments up to 60% and then to full throttle. I think we have a new battery man here. Yeah. You know, I have another one in my... Uh... I don't mind doing this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that, that engine could be throttled uh, for landing. Okay. Then the thing I want to impress here is just the weights of the spacecraft. And this all had to be designed into the mission because weights were critical. Uh, the total weight of the descent stage was just almost 23,000 pounds, but 18,000 pounds of that descent stage was propellant. The ascent stage was just over 10,000 pounds, and just over 5,000 pounds was propellant. So 70% of the lunar module was propellant. Because, and it all had to be calculated and figured in because you, you needed so many pounds of ox, of, uh, propellant, uh, oxidizer, and so many pounds of fuel uh, to make these landings, and uh, it, was, it was quite a, quite a nail-biting calculation. I would, there was a tremendous team of guys involved in this, and I didn't have to do that part of it. Now the fuels, I added this slide. The fuels and oxidizer used on the ascent and descent stages these propellants ignite on contact. They're called hypergolic fuels. No ignition system is required. Pour them together and away you go. The fuel acronym is UDMH. That stands for unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. It's a hydrazine-based fuel with the trade name of Arazine 50. The oxidizer is N2O4. It's like a red fuming nitric acid or nitrogen tetroxide. Both the fuel and oxidizer are stored in bladder tanks, and the backside of the bladder is pressurized by helium to force the propellant down into the engine. There's no gravity up there, so you could uh, put the lunar module and the command service module at any angle and still have 
complete thrust. Both the propellants are highly toxic and must be handled in scape suits with enclosed breathing equipment. Here is a, a, a blow up of the lunar module and the uh, command ascent and descent stages. Uh, the brown tanks are the uh, fuel tanks and the big long uh, silver tanks are the oxidizer. And notice you see on the very bottom of the descent stage is called a she tank. That's the area that I worked on, uh, helped help develop for the system. That is supercritical helium. And we were overweight. And when you d get into these projects, you're always overweight. So NASA was after us, get the weight down, get the weight down, anything you could do. The word on the street in the 60s was if you could show NASA, you could save a pound of weight, they would invest $10,000 into that, into that program. If you could show them you could save five pounds of weight in the structure, they would invest $50,000, but it probably meant some complex changes of thinning out struts and, and redoing the stress analysis on the whole lunar module. What we did with the she tank is originally we had designed two gaseous helium tanks to pressurize the fuel and oxidizer. And we said if you go to a liquid helium tank and put it under pressure, one tank, you could save 300 pounds of weight. So NASA said go for it and we built it. It was a $3 million project back then in 1960 dollars. And it worked. Uh, one of the problems with uh, a liquid helium tank, liquid helium is minus 452 Fahrenheit. It's the coldest element known to man. Minus 460 Fahrenheit is absolute zero. So the tank has a limited life because there's heat leak into the tank and the tank pressure keeps expanding. There was about a six day life in the tank, five or six days. So when you went into orbit for uh, maybe a half a day and went to the moon for three days, it was fine. But you couldn't dilly dally up there too long. <laughs> The ascent stage had gaseous helium tanks. Now after liftoff, uh, this is a phenomenal picture of the actual Apollo 11 coming up to the command service module with the moon surface shown and the Earth in the background. It was taken by Michael Collins. Michael Collins was the astronaut who stayed in the command service module. One of the things to realize here is remember that the command service module is orbiting at 3,600 miles an hour. So the timing of the liftoff is critical and you had to go up and catch up to the command service module and go 3,600 miles an hour. And there was very little, there was very little room for error. You didn't have a chance to go around and do it again. You had one good shot at it and all the missions that portion work perfectly. A little bit about the Apollo 13 disaster. On the way to the moon, the oxygen tank on the service module, again I want to stress that was a North American product, it was <laughs> not a Grumman product. Got to put the plugs in here. The oxygen tank exploded, that oxygen was used for breathing and it was used for the fuel cell. Uh, it had hypergolic fuel and oxidizer in it, but the whole command service module was useless. Fortunately, when the accident happened, they had already made this docking maneuver. Had they not done that, and it had blown earlier, this was the fifth or sixth time that oxygen tank was stirred. They stirred every, I think it was every 12 hours. Uh, we may have lost the men on the mission, but now we're on the way to the moon this way. So what did we do? We were all scrambling. We had teams at the Cape, teams at Houston, teams at Grumman. And uh, go, go ahead and flip that. We had, we, uh, what they came up with was as the whole assembly was heading to the moon and coming in at 5,300 miles an hour, they fired the lunar module descent engine to slow down to 3,600. Down in step two, the moon's gravity was used to do a half an orbit. I call it a gravitational slingshot around the moon. And then they fired the 
lunar module engine again to head back to Earth. And coming back to Earth, the maneuver, actually the trip was three days, it only required two slight mid-course corrections. You have to remember that the Earth is over here when they fire the lunar module and three days later the Earth is over here. So the, uh, the aiming target was, was actually quite good. Part of the problem, coming back, there was uh, several problems. One was battery life on the command service module was limited. There was a time during the trip back for the two, two and a half days that they shut the power down to conserve battery life. And breathing oxygen was barely enough for the guys to arrive back. And the CO2 exhaust from breathing was building up in the cabin. And uh, we had to come up with some plans to rem remedy that. <clears throat> One of the things, uh, wh what you see that big box up there is what they call a lithium hydroxide canister. And that's used to scrub out the CO2 out of the air. And uh, it was not working as well with three men in the cabin versus two. So they uh, came up with using a fan from one of the spacesuits and a tube sock and some duct tape and uh, managed to, just the same stuff we do in the garage, right? <laughs> now, here is uh, the same slide, but you'll notice in the dead center of the slide, I have the she tank vents. Now, that is the descent stage, and that is usually left on the moon, but now it was coming back attached to the, uh, to the command service module. And in our efforts to, low, to reduce weight, once the descent stage lands on the moon and the helium tank, descent stage helium tank keeps building pressure, eventually the, a burst disk would blow and it would vent the tank down harmlessly into space. So we had a thrust neutralizer T, it might have been about a foot or 15 inches long, about an inch, inch and a quarter thin titanium pipe, and it would vent the helium diametrically opposed. So we kept cutting this pipe down. We were taking ounces off the pipe to save weight, anything we could do. We got the pipe down to about that, that long. So instead of being diametrically opposed, the vent went out this way on the moon, which was still harmless. It's not going to blow the descent stage over. So when we were coming back, we told the astronauts about that position in the flight back, that you're going to hear a bang in the next hour. It's a, the burst disc blowing. Don't get excited. The tank is venting down. You don't need it anymore. So when the tank vented down, the vector being this way resulted in a slight push on the vehicle and they reported back, hey, we, we're slightly rolling here. So we brought it back with the reaction control system. Now the reason I'm going into this is because how many saw the Apollo 13 movie? Most of you have seen it, okay. During the Apollo 13 movie, which was quite a good documentation of the flight, when it got to this part, Hollywood couldn't leave it alone. <laughs> they had to ham it up. So when, when they, they reported the burst is going to blow and the helium tank's going to vent, and when it did, they made the spacecraft look like it was going down a chuck hole road in Colorado, <laughs> and all the dishes were flying out of the cupboards. And, and that was the only part of the movie that made me barf, <laughs> to be honest with you. Here's a shot of the service module with the uh, blown quarter panel off. As I mentioned before, the LOX tank was stirred. This was the fifth time it was stirred when it blew. So that was, if it had a blow, it was a, actually a good time. Now on Apo missions uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, the rover was used. It weighed 462 pounds and could carry almost 1,100 pounds. We had to increase the size of the tanks on the lunar module. I forget how much, 10, 12% to carry the extra weight. And uh, it, it worked very well. Here's a rover from Apollo 16. The longest trip was 22 miles during Apollo 17. That's when Harrison Schmidt was up there as a geologist. 
And that was the last time man was on the moon. <clears throat> now, this was some shots from the, in 2010, from the Lunar Re Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. And it snapped the best look at the Apollo 11 landing site. You can actually see the descent stage down there. There's some discarded equipment. And I'm told that when you zoom in on that picture, you can actually see the footsteps. Here's a shot of the Apollo 12 landing. And this is when the Apollo 12 with the lunar module landed near the surveyor. Um, one of the things I'm told that was a real prize on that, I don't know where it is today, but the astronauts cut the camera off the surveyor. So somebody has that in their collection. I don't know where it is. Here's uh, LEM-6, Apollo 12, American flag was left on the lunar surface. I think they put one on for Apollo 11, but I think the ascent stage blew it over when it took off. Now here's a shot of the uh, museum up at the Cape. If you haven't been, you really should go. It's a fabulous museum. Um, they've kind of turned it into a little bit of a, a Disney type thing because there's a lot, of, a lot of manpower required to run it. I was, I was against what they did. I thought the US taxpayers should go free because they paid and built the whole program and the foreigners should pay. Just, just show your uh, birth certificate and you can go free, but they didn't listen to me. <laughs> but uh, we had our 50th reunion, it was 530 people seated in a formal dining underneath that booster. Here's the top view of the Saturn V in the same building showing the command service module and the conical section where the lunar module is stored, the third stage is there. And there's a lot of displays around the perimeter that are worth seeing. There's also uh, a live shuttle uh, that was retired, that was usable. It's at the museum. I've already told you my big beef on retiring the shuttle. I think they should have kept it going. We pay the Russians now 150 million each flight to send two men up there. Now, one of the things, uh, in talking to Fred Hayes, he was, he was kind of adamant several years ago to me, and he said, NASA shouldn't be in the transportation business. They should be in the exploration business. Now you're seeing a lot of the companies like SpaceX and Boeing getting into the transportation business, and SpaceX has done some marvelous things. I think the way their boosters land back at the Cape is incredible. When you, see, when you see that. Uh, there's a planned uh, manned mission to Mars. Uh, Mars has a, a gravity about two-fifths of the Earth, but it has a very, very thin atmosphere. So one of the problems there, you can't really use the atmosphere to do any de-boosting like you can coming back to Earth. You can use the atmosphere if you have an ablative shield to slow down in, into, the, into the Earth's uh, atmosphere to land. Uh, one of the positive things about going to, the, going to Mars is it does have a polar cap, uh, north and south pole with ice, and apparently, who knows, maybe they could uh, take the ice and get some oxygen for breathing and some for propellant. But uh, there's a lot of complications. It's at least a four month trip out, four months back. You have to feed people when they go. And you have to take care of all waste products when they go. So it's uh, not an easy trip. <laughs> a couple of other things I just want to touch on is the, uh, the Hubble has done many solar and galactic discoveries. Uh, this is a, one of the pictures it took of a spiral galaxy that looks like the Milky Way. Uh, but the Hubble is getting old. And soon it will be replaced by the James Webb Telescope. Here's a shot of the James Webb. And uh, Northrop Grumman is under contract to NASA's Goddard, Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, for the design and development of this telescope. It's been delayed. There's been uh, quite, a, quite a bit of cost overruns and 
uh, what, when it goes, the James Webb is supposed to be 100 times more powerful than the uh, Hubble. Here's a comparison of the mirrors, and the, uh, the Hubble mirror is almost seven feet in diameter, but that is the segmented mirror on the James Webb. There's 18 hexag hexagonal mirrors that have to unfold and form a perfect conical shape for the mirror to be accurate. So there's all kinds of considerations of thermal expansion and when it, the sun hits it and on and on. Now Northrop Grumman merged with, uh, or Grumman merged with Northrop to form Northrop Grumman in 1994 with a $2.1 million buyout, paying Grumman $62 a share. A few amazing pictures which have occurred since the moon landing from Hubble. Hubble has taken many deep space uh, photos of the universe and it's amazing uh, what's out there, how, how vast it is. It's totally incomprehensible. The International Space Station uh, was assembled using the shuttle. How many have seen the shuttle come over? Oh, not that many, but it, it's pretty easy to see. You can see it with the naked eye on a clear night it's, or a clear morning. It's beautiful. Sunset or just before sunrise. If you Google uh, or you're on your search engine, dial in ISS, International Space Station, and you'll see a, about the first, second or third item down, you'll see uh, viewing the shuttle, uh, space station near me. Enter your town and your state and up will come a timetable. Now this morning I put in, here's, the, here's what it appears like. This I put in for this group tonight, uh, but the next viewings happen to be all in the morning. And uh, a real good one to me would be August 25th at 6.34 a.m. It's not like, sometimes it's 4.50 in the morning, you know, you have to get up to do that. But uh, it shows you the time, four minutes, and what the height is, 25 degrees up, uh, where it's coming from out of the west, and where it's, where it's settling uh, out of the north. I've seen some beautiful flyovers, and I just look at it every time. It's really exciting to see. It, it orbits at about 275 miles altitude to stay above a lot of the debris, a lot of the debris up there is in the 100 to 200 mile altitude. A couple of more exciting programs was the rovers that went to Mars. Uh, I think the initial plan was to have them last six, I think it was uh, three months, 90 days. One of them has gone over 12 years and uh, it's, it's really incredible what it's, what it's done on Mars. A couple of uh, really spectacular uh, programs that have occurred since the lunar landing. Galileo was launched by the shuttle in 89. It took six years to get to Jupiter. It orbited Jupiter for eight years with many discoveries and found many of the 60 moons around Jupiter. We only have one. Uh, but the flybys, the four major moons, if you have a very inexpensive telescope, you can see the four major moons, very easy to see. I'm talking 20 power, you know, very, very low power telescope. And then uh, one of the other fabulous programs was Cassini. Cassini was launched in 97. It took seven years to get to Saturn and explored the planet for 13 years. Now, when you look at that and you think of that, it probably took 10 years in development of the Cassini spacecraft, seven years to launch it, 13 years in orbit. That's 30 years. Somebody who worked on that from the beginning worked his whole career on that one program. And as I mentioned, the gravitational field of Saturn is quite stronger than Earth, so Cassini had an orbit at 76,000 miles an hour. Here's one of my favorite shots from Cassini. It shows the edge of the Saturn planet, the rings, and off in the back there is that little blue dot is Earth. 
Now you look at that, you look at that and say, how the heck can the aliens even find us? You know, you can, <laughs> you can hardly see it. And my favorite, of course, is Kepler. Kepler was launched and it focused on a very, very tiny area of the Milky Way. And in that tiny area, it surveyed over 140,000 stars. And what it monitored was the dimming of the starlight when a planet would pass in front of the star. Like you see up in the upper left-hand corner, when the, when the planet went in front of the star, I was told that the sensitivity of the, cam of the uh, cameras on Kepler, it could detect a fly flying in front of a headlight the dimming. So it has found and proven 2,300 planets. They're called exoplanets because they're not within, in our solar system. And there's over 3,600 that are candidates. And the universe's size is incomprehensible. Our Milky Way galaxy contains over 200 billion stars. We can only see about 6,000 of them. And the nearest star in our galaxy to, Earth, to, the sun, to the sun is four light years away. And one light year is 5.9 trillion miles. The speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. If you take a flashlight and turn it on, it would actually go around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. That's how fast light is. That's also how fast communications travel. So if you multiply 5.9 trillion times four, it's almost 25 trillion miles, the nearest star to our sun. It's like, wow. Now the universe contains, it was thought to have contained 200 billion galaxies. And then with the recent deep space photographs over the last four or five years by Hubble, now they're saying that there may be one trillion galaxies. So if there's life out there, I say it has to be everywhere. Some of it, some of it may be a billion years ahead of us, so we may not be advertising uh, where we are too much because their star could be toast and they're looking for a nice warm place to land. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end. So. Keep looking up, but before you go, now that you understand a little bit about Earth dynamics, I need to tell you one story. A couple of years ago, I was leaving Stewart, driving due west to Indian Town on 76, State Road 76, and I was moving along pretty good. I was probably doing a good 75 miles an hour. So lo and behold, I looked in my rear view mirror and here's a blue light flashing. Uh-oh. <laughs> I pull over and I show the officer my license and registration. And he says, Mr. Meyer, he said, the speed limit here is 55 miles an hour and I clocked you going at least 75, so I'm gonna have to give you a ticket. So I took the ticket begrudgingly and I got home and I decided I'm gonna fight this ticket. So I went to court and my plea to the judge was this even though it may have appeared to the officer that I was going 75 miles an hour to the west, due to, due to the rotation of the earth to the east in the Stewart area of 850, I was actually going backwards at 775 miles an hour, so the ticket is incorrectly written. So the judge slammed his gavel down and said, case dismissed, much to the displeasure of the arresting officer. Now, chapter two, you haven't heard the rest of the story. A couple of months later, I was in Indian Town heading back to Stewart, doing about the same speed. Blue light in the rear view mirror. And uh, lo and behold, as my luck would have it, the same arresting officer. He said, oh, Mr. Meyer. He said, you know down here on Earth, the speed on 76 is 55. I clocked you going 75 to the east, but due to the rotation of the earth, I'm riding the ticket up for 925 miles an hour. 
So we did, and with the automatic ratchet ups, with the speed zones you go over, the ticket cost me over 20,000 bucks, and I had to do 30 years of community service. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>